we'll get started uh, in any uh, well, very soon. Just a note to folks that are late arriving. There's a number of uh, handout sheets at the front here with uh, detailed information. Uh, I invite you to take one of the sheets and then you can refer to some of the information on that sheet. Still a few empty seats up at the front here. If anybody would like to uh, come sit front and center. So we'll get this uh, public hearing started, this non-statutory public hearing. Uh, and, and I just want to start off by saying, may we live in interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, we don't know what's going to happen in the city tomorrow. There's been, everybody's seen all of the news for the last few days, and I don't know what they're doing. But, uh, <laughs> but, but this uh, public hearing was established through a council motion, and, and so we're proceeding with it, of course. Um, in fact, we're moving forward with uh, the process that council's agreed to, uh, unless something should change in the next oh, day in the city. Uh, so the process we've agreed to is uh, to have this public hearing, to, to listen to the community, and uh, to bring a motion of council, um, bring a motion to council next Tuesday to uh, debate and vote on whether or not to support the 2026 bid. So I'm sure that you've all, you're all aware that there's been a series of motions proposed in the city for their council to consider tomorrow, um, which could end up, depending on how the vote goes, with the city moving forward with the process as, as they have been or essentially uh, stopping the process. Uh, so but for our public hearing this evening, just want to remind people that are here that uh, the motion of council for the public hearing was to receive input on the on the following question. So is it prudent for the town of Canmore to participate in the city of Calgary's bid to co-host the 2026 Olympic and Paralympic Games? And so we're, we're really here to hear from people about the Canmore perspective and not whether it's prudent for the city of Calgary or any other jurisdictions. And as always, I'll ask that people maintain a respectful manner and give each speaker their time to, to present to council. Uh, there's the podium over here for the speaker and I'll remind uh, the speakers that you're addressing council, so not the audience. Uh, as always, there's a five minute maximum. Don't feel you have to take the five minutes, honestly. <laughs> there is a, a helpful clock on the wall, uh, just to count down the time. And uh, I just also wanna um, once again remind people that are here that public hearing is an opportunity for council to hear. We're not gonna be debating or arguing or anything uh, like that. This is your opportunity to simply to speak to council. If there are significant uh, misunderstandings or errors, uh, I might ask the CAO to, to correct the, uh, just for, on a factual basis, those, those misunderstandings. And uh, we'll, we'll rotate the order of speakers and essentially through a show of hands, uh, I'll ask somebody It'll be uh, somebody to speak in support, somebody who wants to speak in opposition, and then somebody who wants to speak in a neutral manner, and we'll just keep rotating in that way until everybody who wants to speak has had a chance to do so. Hopefully we'll 
be here out of here before midnight. Generally speaking, at a public hearing, there's a presentation because usually public hearing is regarding a, a bylaw or development or something, and there's a presentation to be given. Uh, we, we debated uh, over last week whether or not we should try once again to, to make a small presentation. There have been a number of presentations given both in this room uh, by the administration and in other uh, venues by other people. Uh, and uh, we, we came to uh, think that the best option was to, that people are here with, with an opinion or with a perspective and they didn't, they don't want to hear from town administration again. They just want to say their piece. So uh, there won't be any uh, presentation at all. Although, as I say, there is an opportunity to correct um, misunderstandings or, or uh, add a little um, bit of input from, from admin if required. So with that, I... Oh, yes, thank you, Councillor Sanford. Uh, last reminder, please turn off your cell phones. Uh, with that, then, I will open the floor for speakers, and I'll ask somebody who would like to speak in support to take the mic. Mr. Meyer, sure. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Norbert Meyer. I um, want to thank Council for giving the community an opportunity to speak on the topic. Uh, it's a momentous occasion and it's a very important topic for us to all have a chance to speak to. I'm going to keep my comments at a fairly high level and I'm guessing that others will, will speak to some more details. And as uh, Your Worship, you, you repeated the question, is it prudent? Uh, we, we really appreciate that uh, being the frame, the frame uh, in which this discussion takes place. First and foremost though, it's important to create some perspective. We are not talking about hosting the entire Olympics. And so much in our conversations over the last weeks and months, it's been about the Olympics. Uh, so I, I think it's important for us to take that perspective and scale it down and to talk in real terms about what it is we are contemplating doing. And that is we're talking about hosting two of the seven sports, 21% of the events, and less than a quarter of the athletes and officials for the Winter Olympic. Being a host community is a tremendous opportunity and it places us at a proverbial fork in the road. One fork is Canmore's future with the Olympics and the other fork is Canmore's future without the Olympics. Regardless of which fork we take, the future of Canmore will be different than what we are today. With or without the Olympics, continued change and pressure from outside our community is almost certain. Calgary will continue to grow, and visitors will likely come to Canmore in growing numbers. Inter international visitors will likely come in increasing num numbers. So the question really becomes, which fork in the road is going to strengthen Canmore's ability to meet the challenges of the future? Which is the prudent fork for us to take? With or without the Olympics, Canmore needs more perpetually affordable ho housing to grow our ability to strengthen current businesses and to attract new employers, we need more broadband. With or without the Olympics, we will be well served to renew our spirit of community, to inspire our youth, and to encourage the drive for excellence in all areas of our community. Without the Olympics, we're on our own for all of these things. The Olympics forks, fork in the road includes partner funding, for some of our infrastructure needs, resources like perpetually affordable housing and broadband, tools like the opportunity to obtain that elusive resort municipality status that you've been working on for such a long time. All these things are needed for Canmore to succeed in the future. The Olympic fork in the road gives us a platform on which to stand tall for the values we share for fair play and clean sport. So the only prudent course of action is to take this fork and join Calgary's bid to host the 2026 Games. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I'm not, um, that was the one thing I forgot to ask. <laughs> I'd ask that we don't clap and cheer or boo and stomp our feet. It's, it's distracting and, and it makes it that much more difficult for people to actually get up and speak because we all know that can be difficult at times. So I appreciate the intent, but let's not do that. Uh, I'll ask now anybody who'd like to speak in opposition to the games. I had thought it would only be Canmore residents speaking, but. You're right, Mr. Mayor. I'm a BAMP resident. What I would like to speak to. Council, are we fine with hearing from residents outside of Canmore? Pardon me? Okay. You're right, Mr. Mayor, I'm a resident of Banff, but what I have to speak to would be a benefit to Canmore, potentially Banff and Jasper. For one thing, I wish we had a better idea of how strong, of how fervent, of how supportive the Italian um, potential bid is. I think that would give uh, Calgary and in turn Canmore a better idea of the position of strength that they may be working from. In the event that Calgary does go ahead and Canmore piggybacks, I believe that Canmore is in, to a certain degree, the driver's seat. Um, you can yay or nay the success of a Calgary bid or the ease of a successfully Calgary bid by asking for and perhaps receiving additional benefits to those you may already be receiving. The one that I am most concerned with is the granting by the province of municipal resort status. And you, I believe, have discussed that already, but I don't think that you've once again discussed it from a position of strength. And I'm here to suggest that, uh, that um, should, you go, should you proceed with um, a potential piggybacking with Calgary in the event that they proceed, and I believe they will. I, will, I believe that uh, our illustrious Prime Minister will show up on his white unicorn with a bag of money. I'm going to ask you just to be civil and polite and talk about other people. I will. Thank you. But um, I believe it's an excellent opportunity for Canmore to deal from a position of strength to get municipal resort status. Banff and Jasper can piggyback, hopefully, but I know MRS would be extremely beneficial to the town of Canmore for many years to come. It's probably subsequent to the Olympics. Thank you very much. Thank you. And your name was John Whalen, is that yes. right? And, and that sounded like a, a positive, that sounded like a supportive comment, but you meant to have that be I'm not an opposite. I wasn't intending to Okay, uh, I had asked, anyways, that's fine, thank you. So now is there somebody that would like to speak in opposition? Come on, <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> right, first woman with her hand up. Thank you for the opportunity to um, give my opinions. Uh, I sent you all a letter. Hopefully you'll have a chance to read it because it goes into far more detail than what I can do in five minutes. Initially, um, the Olympic Games seemed like a great idea. Um, so, I'm and, sorry, some of us know your name, but oh, just sorry. for the record, if you... Tracy Henderson, Camor resident. Um, I was a bit confused by, by very conflicting information from the various uh, groups uh, involved in the Olympic bid, both for and against. So what I did, what I normally do, is went to the research to see what I could find from unbiased experts, primarily on the economics of the Games. And what I found was pretty shocking. It's an Oxford study, which references many other studies as well, conducted in 2016. 
What they found in that study, this is a business school at Oxford University, is every single Olympic game since 1968 uh, has had cost overruns. Every single one, not one came in on budget. The average overrun for Winter Olympics, 142%. Um, in fact, the Olympics have the highest average cost overrun of any type of mega project in the world. And the, res the report states the Olympics are the costliest, financially the most riskiest of mega projects that exists. So that caused a bit of concern. Then I looked at a few other things. I uh, looked at examples like uh, what can happen even when you're costing out a project that isn't going to happen for so many years. Uh, one example of what can happen, London Games, the security budget was 361000 when they put their bid in. By the time the project was completed, at that it increased by 400%. They spent 1.6 billion on security. Um, cost overruns happen. They happen to all of us. They happen to town accounts, the town of Canmore. The new server room in the Civic Center went 50% over budget. The Cougar Creek flood mitigation increased by 9 million. That's 24% over budget. Rec Center renovation, just a renovation, 2.1 million or, or almost 20% over the original budget. So that happens. So when I look at the cost of running the games and I look at, at perpetually affordable housing, um, looks like a good deal. We're only really putting in 10, uh, four of, of uh, money, to, uh, six of land. But what if? What if the cost of repurposing that go over? What if the cost of construction, the availability of labor, labor the cost of labor, cost of materials, what if when we start this project, those are considerably higher? Um, those are all possibilities. What if we have an economic downturn and sales after the fact are slower than expected? What if we have to carry that $66 million debt longer than when, past when the loan is due? What then is the cost of these per perpetually affordable housing? Uh, look at what happened in Vancouver. The city had to assume $690 million of debt and the taxpayers were on the hook for $110 million to finish their athletes' housing. And conveniently, the IOC has protected themselves. They're not on the hook for any cost overruns. It's the, the players on the ground, Calgary and, and Camor, who are. So in short, we're, we're considering undertaking what I think is Canmore's biggest capital project ever to increase our debt load well above what it has ever been, all to be part of the riskiest financial mega project in existence. And to do this, we're willing to crawl into bed with the most corrupt sporting organization in the world who takes on none of the financial risk whilst allowing, indeed celebrating, government-sanctioned cheating athletes, all for the sake of 218 perpetual affordable housing units and the possibility, but far from certainty, of getting resort municipality status. World f and do we need the world focus on Camor? It could result in accelerated pressure on our town and drive the cost of living up even higher and quicker than it already is. So if our $10 million investment in the games to get these, un these affordable housing units were a sure thing, I'd say, yeah, it's a great deal. But it's not. It's far from a sure thing. And history and the shocking reality of the Olympic financial legacy is that it's not a, it will cost more. Are we being blinded by the glow of the PAH pot of gold at the end of the Olympic rainbow? You'll be spending well over 10 million of our tax dollars and borrowing, increasing our borrowing uh, to invest in this mythical pot of gold. That, I think, is not the responsible route to take. Let's not be blinded by the glory and glitter and short-term perks of an Olympics. Let's see what the real risk is you're taking with our money. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and now I'll uh, look for anybody that'd like to speak in a neutral manner. Is there anybody here that intends to speak in a neutral manner? Are they, there's somebody at the back? Might as well, sure, let's Come on up. And introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Like, uh, I'm Qin Ping Yu. Um, I'm actually like a, a, a formal official of like a Beijing Winter Olympics organizing committee. 
Um, I spent like uh, uh, past two years here, like uh, in this area, like to work for the uh, Lake Louise Alpine Lake uh, Alpine World Cup. Uh, I was here like uh, as an official, like to observe. But I was here like uh, because I love sports, I love the winter sports. I have the passion for it. Uh, I want to introduce like uh, Chinese youth, like uh, um, like what is the real like uh, ski race, and. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity like provided here. Um, so when I heard like uh, Camo and Calgary is gonna like uh, being like be the beat city for the 2026 20, Olympics, I was really excited. Um, but from my side, I can see like uh, uh, I'm in a neutral position um, because like I went to the like uh, Pingchang debrief like for the um, for the meeting. And also, like I went through the World Cups, so, like both alpine freestyle and snowboard. I know like how important the legacy is. Like can be can live to the city and to the area. Mm. Like for example, in China, we um, we were not like a winter sports. Uh, we are not a, we were not a winter sports country at all. But uh, like since like we win the bid for 2020, uh, 2022 Winter Olympics, like the business is booming like in China. The entire like uh, like winter sports industry is in, uh, like increased a lot. For sure, like we have like uh, so many um, downside about like uh, spending like uh, so much money like on the Winter Olympics. Not like Camo and Calgary, we don't even have like most of the vineyards in China. Like we build our own like alpine ski resorts start from zero. Um, like here, like uh, I think for Canada, like you guys already have this opportunity, and Canada is the country like knows like the winter sports the most. Like you have the like even from like uh, even from Beijing, like uh, we started like a Winter Olympics like uh, 88, uh, 88, 88 like Calgary Winter Olympics in Beijing, and also like we invited experts from like Vancouver to Beijing, and uh, we work with them like to learn like uh, how to put up a winter sports together. And uh, we definitely have the financial people on site. Like, I mean, China is not stupid, just uh, like uh, putting like high risk uh, to host the Winter Olympics. But uh, we, we are like, uh, we are the country like to take the, um, take the risk to build the future for our young generation. Um, like uh, right now, like it's just, it's just like hard, like maybe for, um, for people here, like growing up winter sports, like, to imagine like uh, how like uh, the Olympics can influence the next generation, we just uh, um, like in like in the in China we have the uh, activity like right now like to bring the winter sports into school. So um, we we brought so many kids like into the winter sports. I think like for Camo like uh, even though like it's like a big budget for Canada like, for Calgary and for the, for for Camo. To like uh, to host the Winter Olympics, but it's also an op opportunity. Um, like you cannot only like focus your eye on the risk, but as a like you you should like I think you should also like focus on the future and to see like uh, what's the um, what's the upside like Olympics can bring in. Um, I feel like right now like uh, this is such like a wonderful area like for the kids like to enjoy winter sports. The the ski race like is cost really uh, cost a lot, but it's definitely it's not about the race like uh, you bring like to the next generation. It's about like uh, you bring the sports like lifelong sports like um, passion to the kids when they like uh, doing everything like. Uh, uh, Doing everything like from the professional side, uh, I think like the kids and young generation can benefit from seeing the Olympics, like hosting in this town, and also like uh, by practice. Like I, um, I work a little bit with um, with Alberta Alpine also, like to learn like. Uh, um, how to train the next generation. I learned like uh, here, like you have like the wonderful Nancy Green program um, to teach the kids. It actually doesn't cost that much for young, like uh, for young kids to learn like about the ski race. But you actually, um, but you, you, you teach the kids in a professional way. Later on, like they can prog progress so much. Um, and for like, uh, um, it can be, I think it can become a life fortune for the young, for the next generation. Um, like even like uh, for China, like we are not only focused on 
like right now, how many like gold medals we can win? I mean, like we, for winter sports, it's our shortage, and we we are doing so good in summer like Olympics, but we are, we definitely don't have like enough athletes for the for the winter like sports. But we still like uh, to put our um, we still like uh, re like risk the financially to like bring this dream like to to plant this dream like in like our next generation. Um, yeah, I just uh, hope like, um, because this time like uh, we're actually traveling here, uh, and yeah, I see the opportunity here. Like I just want to bring my own opinion to like to the town of Camel, um, to just uh, let the, I think to let people like think about the two sides, not only one side. Like we all take, take risk in life. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'll look for somebody who would like to speak in support. Hello, everybody. Put that there. Okay, we got props. All right. Uh, my name is Patrick Stetler, and I'm just going to go through. A brief recollection of history as, as I remember it, or have been told. In 1979, the mines closed. In 1980, my Patrick, parents... Sorry, I'm sorry. This, so you're speaking to council? Okay. They're, they're happy to listen, but... Okay, sorry. Council. Us. <laughs> I'll start Thank over. You. In 1979, <laughs> the mines closed. In 1980, my parents moved to Canmore. In 1981, Canmore, Calgary, Canada was awarded the 88 Winter Olympics. I was one and a half years old in 81. 1988, I had the honor of wearing this jacket in the uh, opening ceremonies. I got to be a flag bearer for Italy. And in my young life, that was probably one of my extreme highlights. My son now, this year, is one and a half years old. And uh, in 2026, this jacket will fit him. And nothing would make me happier than to have him wear it in the opening ceremonies. Now that being a nice little bit of nostalgia and heartwarming and all that stuff. It's not the main reason that I would like to see the, uh, the Winter Olympics in 2026. Canmore no longer is a small little mining town. We're on our way to becoming a world destination. I've traveled many places. Whenever I say Canmore, people tend to know it, at least in relation to Banff. Um, I believe that the Olympics can be a vessel to get the Canmore that we want for our sons and daughters to exist. So the, the Olympics can be a stepping stone into creating uh, the Canmore that, that we would like to see. And, and uh, that's kind of all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now, looking for someone to speak in opposition. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I can tend to... What's your name? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Darcy Lynn MacArthur. Thanks. Um, I can tend to um, talk a lot, so I'm going to read my uh, piece to keep on track. And I'd like to begin by saying that I support the spirit and the concept of the Olympics. And I really love for our Canadian athletes to compete on an international, international stage. I do not, however, support the Olympics as they are structured today. I do not support this bid for the Olympics for the following reasons. The, the lack of sort of specific clear information and the confusing information has created for me um, zero idea about how much the games would add to my tax bill. 
Um, I don't have any idea about how any cost overrun would impact our personal taxes. And that would be at a municipal, provincial, and federal tax because we would contribute to all three. I also think that there's a perception that Canmore is a wealthy community and therefore can withstand any cost uh, for the games. And I think it's important to remember that we are a diverse community with many different ranges of wage earners. And it's important that the cost of the games do not displace anyone from our community because they cannot afford an increase in uh, taxes because of the games. So because we don't, I feel, have specific information to understand what that future would look like, it's really hard for me to uh, fully support uh, this bid. I feel that the intent of the games is to bring countries together, that where, whatever the outcome of this bid is, I hope that our focus in Canmore is always on building a stronger community, valuing all residents in our community, and having respect for all people regardless of economic level. For me, the 1988 games were incredibly magnificent um, and were in a different era. And it felt to me that in 88, it was easier for corporations to contribute significant dollars. I don't have that same confidence um, in our economic uh, environment. I also wonder about waiting for eight years for additional affordable housing. And uh, this may or may not be accurate, but I, I believe that there are some untapped uh, dollars available to Canmore at the provincial level. I also understand, and hope I'm correct in this, that the Nordic Centre is a provincial venue. So could we not also look to the province to support this venue? So I really want to say I'm not opposed to um, international games for our athletes. I'd like to showcase them. But I'm just really concerned about costs and the impact that it'll have on our community. Um, I would like to see our municipal, provincial, and federal politicians take a leadership role on the world stage to facilitate a redesign of the Olympic paradigm, to make it realistic in our current world situation. And I think that there's a reason that so few countries are interested in this bid at this time, and that we should pay attention to that. I also um, wonder about the uh, impact of increased um, tourism for Canmore without a really good plan in place. It feels like sometimes in the summer uh, we're at our capacity or over and we want the experience for anyone coming here to be a really positive one. So with congestion, no hotel rooms, hotel rooms that cost a lot of money, um, that's a challenge. So when we think about showcasing Canmore on the world stage and potentially increasing that, um, you know, my question is what's our plan for that? So I think it's um, a challenging um, decision to, to make, um, but I just think that the Olympics aren't structured um, in a really positive way any longer, and that the impact for us as taxpayers could be quite significant. So that's my perspective, and I appreciate you listening to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and, and just for information, Olympics or no Olympics, I don't think it'll be eight years before there's another housing project. I think CCHC will be moving on, on some sort of a project before 2026, regardless. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you. Now, if any, is there anybody in the room that'd like to speak in a neutral manner? Back there. Hi. Just to lead off with your name. Yes, hello, my name is Jessie, Jessie Lauchs. Um, first, I want to say, is there internet on this computer? Because I have a presentation that I would like to pull up, if possible. Mm. No, I don't. It was too big to put on a memory stick. No. I'm no? All right. Uh, well, that certainly diminishes the impact of my presentation. But hello, everyone. My name is Jessie. I have been living in Canmore for about three years now. I'm going on my third year, and I've just been loving it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, hello. I have come to speak to the council today about the intention to put a pedestrian bridge over the Palliser area. Now, when I first embarked on the endeavor of the research for the bridge, there was no plan at all in the uh, bid to contribute any finances to the uh, bridge. But at this point, there is 27, 20, or 275,000, I believe, which I would like to say thank you for doing that. Um, 
I came here to really emphasize the importance of this bridge because as council already knows, there is approximately, I'd say between 20 to 40 people crossing the highway by foot in a day. And we have known about these crossings since 2002 is some estimates that I have heard, but I have evidence that the council knows about it from last year about this time. I believe that with the Olympic bid, because they can't do it without Canmore, we have a lot of leverage in what we can ask for, and we can ask for them to pay for more of this bridge and get it done sooner, because the athletic village that's going in beside the Palliser area is effectively going to double the population in the area, which means we're only gonna see more people crossing the highway by foot, more people taking their dogs over the highway, more people walking their bikes over the highway, and it's just, are we really gonna have to wait for someone to get hit by a vehicle to see the actual change happen. We have the Olympic opportunity to make it happen sooner and make it happen faster and have the government contribute more to it rather than just the taxpayers in Canmore. And I think it would be a really good addition to the safety, accessibility, active living goals and the reduction of the need for vehicles in Canmore. And I think it really needs to be more emphasized in the Olympic bid. And that's, that is it. Thank you. And, and again, just for clarification, with or without the Olympics, the pedestrian bridge is on our capital plan and, and it will be built sooner, hopefully, mm -hmm. rather than later, but yeah. Perfect, I'll it, be bothering you about it regardless. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know how to find me. Now I'll ask if anybody would like to speak in support. Mr. Dave. Mr. Good evening, Rodney. everyone. My name is Dave Rodney, and I'm honored to serve as the Executive Director of Tourism Can Canmore Kananaskis, or TCK. And I'd like to begin by thanking everyone for being here today, and of course to Council for the opportunity to offer feedback on the question, is it prudent for the Town of Canmore to participate in the City of Calgary's bid to co-host the 2026 Olympic and Paralympic Games? In a word, I believe the answer is a resounding Yes, for many reasons, including that the bid is extremely responsible from a financial perspective, and that hosting the world is exactly what the people of Canmore and the Canadasis in Canada need right now in realms that go far beyond the monetary aspect. A short time ago, uh, a 10-year-old boy, who happens to be our son, asked me if we'd ever see the Olympics again. I told him that since the winter and summer games are now staggered, that we can witness the Olympics every two years, to which he responded, I already know that, Dad. But since he was, his born, since he was born, the Olympics have been held in China, England, Russia, and South Korea, and in the future, he noted, they are scheduled for Japan, France, and again in China. He was quick to point out he only remembers the games in Vancouver and Rio since he was in his bed sleeping during all of the other Olympics. And he makes a good point. The Western Hemisphere is overdue to host again and not just for the advertising revenue. From the local perspective, by the time 2026 rolls around, it will have been almost four decades since Alberta hosted the games. An entire generation has not personally witnessed the greatest sporting event in the history of our planet here. And other host cities and regions far beyond us have been putting their name on the map ever since 1988. It's high time that we remind the world of who we are and what we can offer. From the tourism perspective, the benefits are not just in the weeks of the Olympics and the Paralympics. Far from it. The benefits will be enjoyed for all of the years before 2026 and also in the years that follow. For instance, Vancouver Whistler has posted double digit increases in tourism every year since 2010. And that's exactly what Canmore Kananaskis needs in the winter. At TCK, we are tasked with finding the holy grail, increasing tourism from Thanksgiving Day to Victoria Day not in the summer, so that we can offer visitors incredible experiences in all four seasons during which they can learn about and enjoy and treasure and respect and protect Canmore and Kananaskis, just like we do. And at the same time, we can ensure employees year-round work so that they can truly make this their home. But we all know it's becoming increasingly difficult as affordable housing becomes more and more difficult to find. But this is another area in which the Olympics are the answer. 
Athlete accommodation will more than double Canmore's affordable housing portfolio and as I mentioned, includes flood mitigation and a pedestrian overpass. That's 1,250 more beds worth $116 million of which Canmore is only responsible for $6 million in value of CCHC owned land and $4 million in cash. And Canmoreites really have three options, at least in this respect. They can say no to the Olympics and pay the entire affordable housing bill themselves. They can choose to not build. Or they can utilize this once in a lifetime opportunity to have Canadians from coast to coast help to pay for most of the bill on their behalf. And to me that only seems fair and right since we share our playground with our fellow Canadians every day of every year, and this would actually be a tiny number in comparison to the billions of dollars of transfer and equalization payments we've shared with Canadians every year for decades. Additionally, in a direct turnabout from previous practice, the IOC is not asking for money. In fact, instead, they are ready, willing, and able to write us a check for well over a billion dollars. And I simply cannot th fathom how anyone could ever consider walking away from that incomparable opportunity. Amongst other things, this would pay for Nordic Centre and Nakiska upgrades, ensuring that everyone from elite athletes to beginners will enjoy the opportunity to utilize perfect places to exercise outside. As past Provincial Minister of Wellness, I can tell you nothing helps me burst with pride more than seeing healthy eating, active living programs and policies that are positive, proactive and preventative. This is a wonderful opportunity and I wish I had more time. Thank you, Council. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Rodney. If I'd closed my eyes, I would have thought I was in the legislature there. <laughs> I'll look to see if there's anybody like to speak in opposition. Sir? My name is Hal Retzer, and I've been a resident of Camden for about 20 years. Um, I guess uh, I sent you guys all an email this morning with, um, with really imploring you guys to seriously think about whether uh, there's any parallel to the 2026 Olympics versus the 1988 Olympics. And, and I guess I would say that um, there's quite a difference. 1988, it's been mentioned, you know, the town of Camber was, was coming out of um, the mine closures and uh, there was no doubt Camor kind of needed to be put on the map. I, I, I don't think anybody would disagree that it probably was a really good thing economically and, and even socially for the town. Two, 2026 is a different story. I, I really don't think that having the Olympics is really needed to showcase Camor. Camor is pretty pretty much on the map already. Um, I don't. Uh, my personal belief is is that the it's been mentioned a few times that the town is kind of at capacity, and I would say it's at capacity, you know, people-wise, environmental-wise, wildlife-wise. You know, another Olympics here will just showcase it more. And yes, maybe we'll get some perpetual affordable housing out of it, but we will also attract a whole lot more second homeowners that will build you know, s second homes, multi-million dollar homes, which do nothing for increasing affordability in this town. So I'll leave that thought with, with you guys on that one. Um, the, other, the other point I wanna make is, is switching gears a little bit on the financial side. It's been mentioned that the risk of a cost overrun is, is, is certainly possible. And, um, and, and I think it's been said, uh, people know that that is quite a risk for mega projects. Um, I would say that, you know, we talk about this $100 million exposure, $116 million exposure that the town is getting primarily in professional affordable housing. If Camor is taking the entire brunt of the overrun of the risk, and let's just say it's 50% of that, which is not, un not unheard of, um, that's $50 million or more of potential overrun coming out of our coffers. Um, and that's compared to the $10 million that we think we're putting in is a considerable number, overrun number than w what, we're, what, we're, um, what we really think we're being exposed to. So I think the risk is, is the financial risk is very great that I, I think, you know, that I implore you folks to really understand that. I have no idea whether Bidco out of, out of, you know, the Calgary guys have actually communicated how that's all going to work, but my understanding is that we're on the hook for that overrun. And even if it's a 25% overrun on $100 million or 100, that's a lot of extra money that we, we're, we're going to have to spend that's not part, not part of the $10 million we've talked about already. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. 
Is there anybody in the room that would like to speak in a neutral manner? Anyone at all? In which case, I'll look for somebody who'd like to speak in support of the bid. Mr. Rempel. So my name is Ron Rempel, and um, I'm speaking on my uh, personal behalf, not on behalf of BOTA. So just to be clear, this is my personal opinion. Um, and you're right, Mr. Mayor, this may be a, a meaningless discussion if Calgary decides to pull the plug on this uh, tomorrow. That's outside of our control. However, one thing I would really like to say is um, I'm proud of how Canmore has handled this issue from the, uh, the start of that, of, of, the, of the potential bid for the Olympics. Um, I'm just impressed with how admin and council has taken a proactive approach on this, making sure that you get the information, that you get it out to the public. Um, I think the use of the $200,000 from the Economic Development Reserve Fund was prudent. It was wise to do that, and uh, it was just a good use of those funds. And um, the, the fact that we had Lisa and Jim working on that file and that we were able to get good information coming back to us as a community, I think has really helped us along. So regardless of what happens tomorrow, I think Canmore can hold our heads up high and say, we did it well, and, and we handled this process really well, so thank you. In my opinion, it is prudent for Canmore to participate in the 2026 Olympic and Paralympic Games. We've already discussed, many people here, how uh, Canmore is already attractive. We are already on the map, um, and so people are going to be coming here. But we've known for a number of years that our maximum footprint, that our maximum uh, capacity here is about 30,000 residents. So that's not a surprise. That's something that was in the 1998 Municipal Development Plan. Um, we know that Alberta is growing, we know that Calgary is growing, and we know that this is the backyard for many Albertans. So we know that we're going to be seeing some more tourism growth within Canmore, regardless of whether we have the Olympics. And, and I like what uh, Norbert said about the fork in the road. I agree with that. And uh, I think that um, we can use the games as a tool and as a lever to uh, obtain some key assets and tools to manage the growth that we know that we're going to see regardless of whether the Olympics come here or not. So I've sent a letter to you that outlines um, my opinion on that. I'm not going to go into any detail on that. Um, but I think that there's, in, in my opinion, three top legacy assets and tools that we need to proactively pursue through uh, participating in the Olympics. People have talked about the affordable housing already, and I agree with that. I think that the uh, 242 units would be a key asset for the community. And um, if we can get a $116 million asset for really a $4 million cash investment, I think that that is prudent. And um, I'm confident in our uh, affordable housing corporation to be able to put together those numbers and uh, have a budget and be able to stick to that budget and make that happen. Um, and I'm, again, we can leverage the Olympics for the two other assets that we can get as a result of that, the um, flood mitigation and the pedestrian overpass over the Trans-Canada Highway. And again, you're right, Mr. Mayor, those things are already on the uh, horizon. They're either things that we're going to be pursuing anyway as a community. So if we can get additional funds to help with that and leverage the Olympics to help to pay for that, again, I believe that that is prudent. A second um, legacy asset is the upgrade to the, uh, the Canmore Nordic Centre. And um, this asset has had a significant impact on our community since the 88 Olympics. And by upgrading the Nordic Centre, keeping it current, I think that we can continue to enjoy that facility for many years to come. And not just for athletes and bringing in more um, World Cup events, I know that that's, that's important, but also just for us as a community to get out there and enjoy it. I love to be able to go up there and uh, to go for a ski or a bike ride. I think that that is uh, a community asset that we can continue to enjoy for decades to come. And finally, the long-term funding model. And again, a lot's been talked about that already, but we know that when Whistler was announced as the mountain host for the 2010 Olympics, the resort municipality status was expanded. 
has allowed Whistler to cover their costs for the games and provided enhanced funding for marketing and infrastructure for the future of the municipality. I think that's something that we can continue to get for Canmore as well and will benefit our community for many years to come. I think that that alone would be a game changer for Canmore and really allow us to continue to grow and to, to build the infrastructure that we need, not just for the residents, but for the people that come here as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just notice there's a box of tissues there. Was that intentional? Did we expect tears? Uh, I'll then look for anybody who'd like to speak in opposition to come forward. Sir? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Jeff Goldberg, and I'm a resident of Canmar. Um, uh, pro to provide some context in the push and pull that I'm feeling, I'm an avid sportsman, sports person, sorry, and I've um, had the um, thrill of enjoying multiple Olympics in my life. I was present in Montreal. I was present a little bit in Calgary at the time I lived in Edmonton. And I certainly believe in the concept of the Olympics. I'm also um, a, a strong advocate for the environment, so I'll, I have a push and pull thing going on here. Um, uh, I, I've, in an unwavering way, I've, I've been opposed this time around for the Olympics, um, and I'm going to limit it to um, three basic areas which I think are driving my, my thinking to this time. Um, first of all, I can't see any way that um, in terms of the long-term economic situation in Canmore, that Canmore will be um, a more affordable place than it would be without the Olympics if there is an Olympics. I should say in my first two years, almost two years of living here, that I've really been disappointed to hear on a number of occasions, that being maybe five or six over these, this 18 months, um, of people who are telling me that they're, they're leaving Canmore, and of course I, I ask why. I'm very disappointed to hear that because I think this place is incredible and, and it's always affordability. And this happened as recently last week at this wonderful photography event that we had at the Bow River at the, at the Engine Bridge. Um, I, I can't see, we, we have a rapid pace of development, I understand that, and I can't see that pace not being accelerated um, as a result of the Olympics. Um, that, in addition to the cost overruns we've already heard about, um, I, I feel like as a taxpayer and concerned for the general community that affordability um, will be an even larger challenge down the road. The second area that I'm thinking about has to do, and we heard about it from one speaker t tonight already, um, about uh, the Olympics as they're structured and in terms, especially in terms of my lost confidence and trust in the Olympics, especially in terms of an organization really believing in clean sport. The, the events that immediately preceded our last win Winter Olympics um, around the about face we saw turning away from the concept of clean sport to allow um, a nation back in um, after there was very clear and I think um, appropriate steps taken um, to support the notion of clean, clean sport. Uh, to me that was one of the biggest disappointments I've ever, ever experienced in sport and um, it, it, it severely eroded my confidence in the organization that, that uh, puts together the Olympic Games. Um, that in particular hurt Canada and athletes from this area because we have athletes um, who either are from or train in this area who were directly affected by the events leading up to the initial decisions to, to uh, ban um, a large number of athletes from one of the large nations. And um, it, it, it really had a large impact on how I feel about the Olympics despite the fact that I really enjoy the games and the notion of the games. And finally, maybe a little bit less direct to Canmore, but the Kananaskis really is one of our adjacent partner areas that we're also proud about. 
I have very strong concerns. Um, they might not be well-founded. I haven't done a lot of research on this, but I, I know that there's talk of how to make the downhill events, and in particular the downhill skiing events at Nakiska work in a way that brings it up to international, current international standards. And my concern is the language we're hearing now won't be sustained in terms of what needs to be done to make that downhill course feasible. And um, I find that area through the Kananaskis Corridor so valuable in terms of its wildlife and, and, and the natural history of that area and any increase in the development footprint um, in that area I think will have a lasting negative impact uh, uh, on our wildlife in that area and, and for that reason I'm opposed. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. I'll just point out that if you have questions about the plans for KNS, if you want to understand more detail, Jim Yonker's in the room somewhere. Right there, right there. <laughs> and he could uh, answer some questions for you about what's being planned in the downhill uh, venue. Now look for anybody that'd like to speak in support. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, I'm Morgan Rogers. I'm here to speak in favor. Uh, I'm sorry, I was what was your name? Morgan Rogers. I'm in favor. I was born and raised in Canmore, and I'm currently attending U of C, so I've just come home from the city to be able to speak here tonight. And I've also voted in favor in the Calgary plebiscite via a mail-in ballot. Uh, I'm a good example of someone who's really benefited from the legacy of the 88 games as I grew up learning how to ski and eventually racing cross-country skiing at the Nordic Center, sharing those trails with my heroes, Chandra Crawford, Sarah Renner, and Devin Kershaw, as the national team was based in Canmore, again as a result of the 88 games. Now as a kinesiology student in Calgary, most of my classes are just down the hall from the Olympic Oval, and I'm there reminded of the 88 games every day as well. This puts me in a unique position as I'm seeing Calgary and Canmore's side for this bid. I would also like to point out that another benefit from the games can extend beyond winter sports, as my good friend Erica Weeb is the Olympic champion from 2016 Summer Games in women's wrestling and has come out publicly multiple times to say that a big piece of her success was training at the UFC and at the legacy venues at Winsport. Uh, many people are focusing on the stats, figures, and numbers tonight, and I have one stat to share that resonates with me, but my most important uh, piece coming here to speak today is talking about the human aspect of the Olympics, something that transcends the numbers and can't be quantified. I'll just share my statistic first. It's something that's really important to me, and it's that 81% of Canada's Olympic medalists from the 2018 Games in Pyeongchang have either trained or competed at the venues in Calgary and Canmore. That's a pretty substantial legacy that can't be argued. But like I said, what I'm drawn to are the human stories. As someone who spends my weekends in Cam or home from school, ski coaching the next generation of skiers, I can't help but think about the kids. Imagine the, the opportunity they're given to watch the best in the world right in front of them instead of a TV screen. This introduces them not only to high level sport, but potentially sports that they haven't even seen before or knew existed. Uh, to illustrate this, I recently heard in an interview with Scott Moore that he made his decision to pursue high-level figure skating when he heard that Vancouver was awarded the games and he was so inspired by the idea of competing at home. Another thing to consider, as many people know and I mentioned, Cross-country skiing and biathlon national teams are based in Canmore, and many national teams are also based in Calgary. So a number of my very close friends competed in the past games this winter, and a very common thread in most of their comments was that one or both of their parents were not able to attend the games to watch them because it's too far away, too expensive, and too difficult to get there, and they were already saying they knew it would be the same issue in 2022 Beijing. Imagine how special it would be to have the games here, allowing all athletes to have all of their family and friends watching them and cheering them on. 
Finally, as it's been mentioned a few times, doping is a big issue right now. It's very prevalent, especially when we have a leader like Becky Scott, who champions clean sport living in our community. Many people will say this is a reason that we shouldn't get involved in the games, and I think that's why we should. This gives us an opportunity to show the rest of the world that you can host a games morally and ethically sound and not have doping or corrupt uh, politics get involved. My final thought to conclude is just that we have a really special opportunity here and we don't want to waste it. But with that opportunity, we also have a big responsibility. The outcome of our decision will not only affect Canmore and Calgary, but the rest of Canada as well. That's something we need to consider. Let's show the world what we can do. Thank you for listening, and I hope Council will vote in favour of the 2026 bid. Thank you very much. Now looking for somebody who would like to speak in opposition. I'm looking way to the back because everybody seems to be coming from the front. Uh, my name is Kristen Slagorski, and that was pretty heartwarming, so I didn't want to follow that one, but I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you to administration and council for all the work and difficult decisions that you make for our community every day. Um, I'd also like to specifically thank Councillor McCollum for creating the opportunity to speak tonight, and for Lisa DeSoto for all your hard work leading up to this. Um, I'm going to be referring heavily to the social impacts on host cities analysis that was commissioned by the BIDCO and created by an international sport event consultant in April 2018. It was designed to match uh, key objectives with areas of priority with respect to the impacts, experience, and outcomes of previous host cities. And I'm going to be highlighting several key pieces of information in the areas of housing, environment, and economics that I think are particularly relevant to Canmore. So the obvious place to start is housing. Regarding housing, the report highlights, quote, mega events have come to rely on social legacy areas such as housing affordability and infrastructural enhancements to rationalize public expenditure, even though past host experience indicate the opposite is true. Example one, quote, evictions, displacements, and abandonment of social commitments such as affordable or social housing are also common as there are few protections ensuring social commitments are met and little recourse or accountability. End quote. During the Calgary 88 Olympics, excessive rent led to the eviction of 2,000 people from one of Calgary's poorest neighborhoods adjacent to the Saddle Dome. This is a problem we already experience in the Valley, with most of us knowing someone who's been forced to move or leave as rent increases. Example two. During the 2010 Olympics in Vancouver, the city and province had to step in with an additional billion dollars to ensure the village would be built on time and to save the project from failure. Quote, this meant that the 10 original commitments to deliver an equal balance of affordable, middle income and market housing skewed greatly towards market housing. Of the approximate 1,000 units in the development, only 28 were rented at the shelter assistance rate. End quote. And then example three. In Barcelona 1992, quote, between the time the bid was announced and the staging of the games, Housing crisis, or housing prices increased by 250%, while the number of available rental units decreased 75%, and the construction of public housing units slowed dramatically. So this is good news or bad news, depending if you're an owner or a renter. In terms of the environment, the report states, quote, that critics have identified the environmental protections only serve a rhetorical purpose, and that in reality, there is minimal oversight provided when environmental promises are broken. Meaningful incorporation of sustainable practices is not well articulated or enforced by the IOC. The aspirational goals attached to housing, such as carbon neutrality and zero waste, cannot be real, or sorry, to hosting, such as carbon neutrality and zero waste, cannot be realistically considered to be achievable targets, but continue to be a, a means of legitimizing for host organizing committees. Sydney, Beijing, Vancouver, and even Rio all kind of pl uh, platformed on a, on a green games, but quote, ironically promises made in the name of sustainability show significantly diminished if not negligible returns. And our wildlife corridor is already struggling. 
The report goes on to stay reg state regarding economics. The economic benefits from hosting the games are negligible, while the projections of benefit are almost always overstated or a fraction of initial projections. Cost overruns are the most significant constant amongst previous hosts. There are no long-term positive impacts to tourism, trade, or employment. And research has shown that the Olympics Games budget overrun with 100% consistency, exceeding projected budgets in real terms by 179%, making hosting the Olympic Games one of the riskiest mega projects that exists. So the question today at hand is regarding prudence. On page four of the 2017-2018 budget, the town's plan for belt tightening initiatives included, quote, reducing projects to match resource capacity available to accomplish them. Co-hosting the Olympics is incongruent with that plan for financial stewardship. At the hearing last Tuesday, the statement was weighed, why would we leave $42 million on the table? And to me, the answer is because there's just too many strings attached. I want our community and governance to have the flexibility and nimbleness to respond to whatever the future brings. In the last eight years, we've had a flood. We've had an enormous amount of services introduced by the people here. And I'll just stop there. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Had you provided that in a written format as well? I will, yeah. It, you can Google it as well. Social impacts on host cities analysis. And it was Great. prepared by Halcyon. Thank you. Thank you. Now look to see if there's anybody like to speak in support. My name is Cheryl Cooper, and I'm here representing the Bow Valley Chamber of Commerce. I am director at large for the Bow Valley Chamber of Commerce. I wanted to start by saying thank you to council and the administration for the opportunity to open up this discussion to our community. It's uh, important for us to be able to do that and for everybody's voices to be heard. The chamber surveyed our members in May of 2018 and offered findings of this survey to our community with respect to the Olympic bid, uh, including the town of Camor in early June of 2018. The results of that were that 75% of our businesses were in support of the Olympic bid and continuing on that track. We have submitted a document reflecting this to the town of Camor and summarizing the results and the themes that evolved from any of the comments or concerns that were expressed by our members. And essentially those numbers speak for themselves with respect to the businesses that we represent. Our members are strongly supportive of a 2026 Olympic opportunity and the chamber respectfully requests that the town take our membership voice into consideration in its deliberation. Are there challenges? Yes, of course there are. Are there opportunities? Yes, of course there are. Progress isn't easy, the future is coming and requires vision, and no one vision will be universal, so we do need all of our voices to be heard. Chamber respectfully submits that the opportunities outstrip the challenges. The 2026 Olympics provide Camor with a unique opportunity to develop, plan, and execute a vision in anticipation of future generations. Thank you so much for your attention and for the Town Council's commitment to our community. Thank you. Now, is there anyone who'd like to speak in opposition? How's that for volume? Excellent. It's good for me. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll be speaking here. louder when I'm actually speaking. Is that okay? Excellent. Thanks. Um, uh, councillors, Your Worship, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I, in answer to the question, I do not think it is prudent for council to support the Olympic bid. Just your name, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer Stelfox. Um, so I do not think it's prudent for council to support the bid um, for the following reasons. Um, firstly, I'm concerned about the potential environmental impact. Um, I think. Nearly 12 years ago in the 1996 Banff Bow Valley study, um, it was said that we are already at or approaching the threshold for 
some of our large, uh, large creatures in the valley, such as grizzlies and wolves. And uh, that's 12 years, 12 years ago, and we've had significant growth and increase in tourism and recreation since then. And as many people are likely aware uh, in this room, um, we already juggle difficulties uh, making sure that those wildlife corridors stay wide enough and functional uh, with increasing use and uh, uh, looking to find funding and ways of effectively educating and managing people in those corridors. Um, I believe that the games would increase that more than might otherwise happen. Um, and therefore, that is one of my great concerns, is that the pressures on the ecology of this valley um, that we're privileged to live in would be, uh, would be too great. Um, next is that I, I believe that it doesn't help the main things that we're struggling with. The first, which I already listed, is environmental concerns. Um, the second is very much affordability, as we have all heard. Um, and then the third is the need to create jobs that are above minimum wage um, that are not necessarily in the service industry. Um, I believe the games would create predominantly low-income jobs. Uh, in the Bidco presentation on Sunday, they did mention that there would be some engineering and construction jobs, um, but they indicated that those would be during the lead-up um, and during the games. Um, there was no mention of the long-term creation of meaningful and, and uh, living wage jobs. We already have a strong tourism industry here and many, many jobs that support that, and those jobs are the underpinning of the functionality of Canmore, the servers, baristas, housekeepers, and, uh, and all of those other positions. And those people are already struggling to find places to live, and, and uh, that continues to be um, a very transient community, partly for that reason. Um, and so if this bid, in addition to being very financially risky, as indicated by previous speakers, if it doesn't address what are, in my view, our top three concerns, um, environmental sustainability, affordability of housing for low-income workers, and creation of long-term, higher-wage jobs, then what benefit is really in it for us? Um, I know that having uh, sporting facilities that attract high-level athletes and coaches is very important. Um, I believe that they are already attracting them and that if there is some concern that they may not continue to do so, that there are other ways of investing funding in those um, in consultation with people who know that best, which is not me. Uh, but I think there are other ways of investing in that to ensure that it continues to attract the best coaches and athletes. And if the athletes are having trouble affording to live here, that is another issue that is addressed by low-income housing rather than the perpetually affordable housing. Um, I'm sure you're all aware on council and your worship of this, but I'll say for the benefit of the record and those listening in the room, um, the clarification that perpetually affordable housing is not low-income housing. Um, it fills a need that is very much needed. I have several friends who have recently benefited from the Hawks Bend. One second. Um, who have benefited from Hawks Bend. I myself am on the list, um, although I am still well below a wage that could afford um, the houses which are on the market now, and the, these, uh, these perpetually affording units from the Athletes Village would be even more expensive by several times. Um, and so, you know, for clarity, if a, if a bid, if I were ever to support a bid, it would absolutely need to include low-income housing, and, uh, and this one, does not at the moment in addition to the concerns over financial stability, the financial over, overruns, and, uh, and then of course as we've heard, the corruption of the IOC, and certainly I heard in the way that they treated Becky Scott and um, sort of the, the dismissiveness with which they, they dealt with her, um, seems like that's, it's not a very good uh, people to be in partnership with. Um, so in summary, I think that the bid will leave behind those who are already struggling, um, and will not significantly help them uh, to sustain our community. And I think the people who are already struggling are just as valuable as those who are not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody who'd like to speak at this time in support in the doorway? Good evening, Council. I'd like to quickly just uh, say thank you for allowing us the opportunity to speak today. It's been great to hear some very passionate views, both for and against, and I've learned a lot here tonight already. Um, my name is John Morris. I uh, am a proud Canadian athlete. I grew up in, uh, in Ontario, 
and I moved out west uh, uh, in 2000, early 2000s. Uh, one, of the reason, one of the main reasons I moved out west was because I witnessed the 88 Olympics. I was lucky enough to, to play in an event uh, in Calgary and fell in love with, with Alberta and the western culture and uh, have benefited, uh, much like many other athletes, from the resources that were left from those games and the legacy of 88 games. Um, but more importantly tonight, I want to speak to you from, I'm a new resident of Canmore. I've moved here a few years ago because over the last decade, I've come up uh, to enjoy the, uh, the Bow Valley and have fallen in love with, uh, with its, uh, you know, what it offers, much like many people here tonight. And I'd like to just address a few concerns. I think there's, there's, there's quite some common concerns that uh, seem to be um, coming to the forefront here. And uh, not that I necessarily know the answer, but I'd like to, to help uh, with the understanding of them. Uh, for the, for the first, first and foremost, um, I'd like to just talk briefly about the development uh, impact here. I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's no secret, but I, I think that not enough people know that regardless of hosting the, the, uh, the uh, 2026 games, we already have, you know, the secret is out about Canmore, um, and that there is a lot of, uh, of, of potential development that we've already planned for moving ahead. And uh, just from, from living here the past few years and ex specifically seeing how we've dealt with this process for these upcoming games compared to the city of Calgary, I'm even more proud to have, to have moved here because I think that it's, I am just as concerned as many other people here regarding the uh, pressure it's going to put on the environment here. But I think that from what I've seen tonight and uh, from, from the passion and concern I've heard from the citizens that I'm sure uh, you know, won't be quiet, uh, will result in us, or the, the decisions we make surrounding these games, uh, very positive as far as uh, how we deal with the environment. I think it's impossible to have a, a you know a, a perfect answer right now, but I think that we're going to be able to make these decisions together. It sounds like you guys listen with open ears, which is great, and I think it's something that we can really create a, a positive result from. Just regarding, uh, also regarding, I heard some some stats regarding uh, previous games, and I think that a lot of those stats are a little bit misconstrued because we're comparing these games to summer games, which are about. I think five or ten times as big as the winter games. And secondly, we're com comparing this to g previous games that have been hosting, hosted elsewhere in the world. We're very lucky to live here in Canada. And um, I think that if we were going to compare it, we should compare it to our previous few games where we had in 88 and 2010. And uh, both those games uh, were, I think most people in this room were cons would consider a very big success for our nation. Uh, and I think that's where we should compare. Uh, I think we have much more... Uh, responsible governments and some other countries' governments that have hosted games in the past. And lastly, regarding the IOC, because I know this is a big one, and it's a big one for me as well, uh, in no means do I condone what has happened uh, over the last, you know, forever, I guess, with, with the Olympic Games regarding some of the IOC's decisions. I know how uh, disheartened we were in the airport when we heard that decision amongst all of Team Canada with what they, the decision they made uh, for the last games because I was with pretty much most of the team, uh, team at the airport. However, there's been enough uh, ruffling of feathers, I guess, and there's been enough presented uh, to the IOC that, that uh, you know, these previous games have, have left a black eye on, on the Olympic legacy. And the fact that you know, it's, been, uh, it's been acknowledged that they made some mistakes in the past of hosting games in huge cities where uh, there was buildings uh, built for, you know, just for the games that would be torn down after. That's why they're moving much towards a more sustainable games. That's why, uh, you know, our, our, our bid can be, is considered very strong. And um, regarding doping, one last thing, they only have 30 seconds left. Uh, we are very proud as Canadian athletes to, to be um, clean athletes. And there's no way, to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as you can tell, I'm a passionate, uh, passionate athlete, but there's no better way than to promote this and be leaders in this rather than turn our backs on the Olympics. We can do it the Canadian way, and we can show the rest of the world uh, the right way to do it. And I hope we get that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm looking to see.
see if there's anybody who'd like to speak in opposition. Opposition, anybody else opposed to the bid would like to speak? Anybody? Oh. Karen? My name is Karen Antrobus. Um, I agree with so many of the speakers who have spoken in opposition that I'm afraid I'm going to be repetitive. And if you don't have very many people coming up to speak on this side, I think it's because we all have the same concern. And so many people have said it so well that uh, there'll be a lot of people in the audience that maybe don't want to waste your time by saying it again. Um, I spent enough of my life working in and around project management to know that when somebody puts together a bid, they put their heart and soul into getting it as well as done as well as they possibly can. They're not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. They're really very sincere, um, and they do the best job anybody could do. But there is absolutely nobody who can predict the world downturn in 2008, which impacted the last the uh, uh, Olympic housing that was built both for London and Vancouver in a really big way. The governments had to step up with. Uh, incredible amounts of money to cover that. Um, nobody can predict a, a flood debris dam. Nobody can predict how much the cost of construction is going to be going up at that time. We know that businesses all over town are going to be renovating to get that last thing done. Um, homeowners who are looking at renting or hosting family are going to be doing renovations. Businesses are going to be doing renovations and all sorts of Olympic construction is going to be going on. So it's, it would be a pretty normal expectation that the cost of construction will be higher than you expect sitting here today. Um, and we, the great news is that uh, we've, at least has already identified a fantastic way to mitigate that so the town doesn't have to eat that money, and that is to sell more units at the market level and fewer units as PAH. So when we see these numbers, my caution to you, understanding the risk of them, is that your risk is that these are not the numbers that you will end up with in terms of how many PAH units that you have. It just takes one problem, one error. Um, one of the biggest causes of overrun on any large project is having a hard deadline that you cannot move. So when, you, when something goes wrong, you can very often let the project slip. So your water table is a little too high, we have a flood, we have a fire, whatever the deal is. You can just let the project slip a little bit until things calm down and deal with it. But when you have a hard and fast deadline, you can't do that. And so you end up having to throw excess over time and excess hands at the project to try and get in on deadlines. So that's one of the reasons why Olympic projects are in that category of mega project that are more likely to go over. It's because you have a deadline that you cannot change. Um, I think a lot of people have said some just really brilliant things about um, do we really think that anything that we're doing here is going to make the environment better, it's going to make affordability better, and is going to um, let, lead to more economic diversification, which Prior to us talking about the Olympics, those were the three biggest things on everybody's list, and it would just be an incredible crying shame if we throw those things out, because the Olympics is, and I admit it, absolutely a fabulous party. It would be fantastic to have my family all come and stay with me and have the, have, you know, be able to attend the Olympics here. But to do that while losing sight of those other three things would be uh, just a real crying shame. Um, the last piece I'm going to talk about is something that as soon as I uh, use the word, somebody's going to say that's off topic, and my suggestion is that if you think it's off topic, that's the problem. Um, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recently told us that we have essentially 12 years to make a dramatic change to how we put out emissions in the world, and Canmore needs to be doing our piece. And I was a little distressed speaking to a couple of councillors in the last couple of weeks to learn that it's not really a conversation that we're having in the town yet. Um, World Wildlife Fund's also put out some numbers saying in the last, uh, since the 1950s or 60s or so, something like 40 or 50 percent of the species on the planet no longer exist. And Canada's in a similar place in terms of the number of mammals that we have lost over that time, an enormous proportion. So, you know, what are we doing? I don't want to be part of fiddling while Rome burns, which is pretty close to what it is when you have a fabulous party instead of saving the planet. Um, so I, I remember when we were working on Elevation Place, a phenomenal amount of staff effort and community effort that went into doing that. Huge stresses that people went through. The Olympics is going to be the same. There is no way that we can do both of those things. We cannot make the massive change in emissions that we need to make as a nation, as individuals, and as a community while also putting the amount of effort that we need to put into to host a fabulous games. And so I would ask you to think seriously about what our community priority is in those areas.
Thank you. Just I want to note that the town of Canmore is doing a lot more than nothing in addressing climate change. We have, uh, well, you can you can look at some of the reports. We've been doing quite a bit. Okay. This is in support. Okay. Flip the coin. I jumped in front of Casey there. So uh, my name is Greg Thompson and a uh, resident of Canamore. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. And, uh, and I too think the process has been, been very good and the, uh, the decision to, to move forward, um, uh, it's, been, it's been a good process finding out all the information and I'm obviously in support of, of the 2026 uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games. I'd like to speak a little bit about volunteerism um, the 2026 Olympic and Paralympic Games in Kenmore hosting the Nordic and Biathlon events for the Olympics and the Paranordic events for the Paralympics will really be a great way to showcase the Kenmore volunteer power. Um, I think we all know that Kenmore volunteers have been delivering races at the local, regional, national, continental, um, and the international level since 1988 and prior to that even. And it's at one of the best known and liked venues in the world. If you talk to the athletes, they all love coming to Canmore and to the Canmore Nordic Center. Last year, I had the incredible opportunity to be involved in the Paranordic World Cup at the Canmore Nordic Center. So I'm calling that an adventure because it was 10 days of early mornings, really late nights, some, some truly panic-inducing moments. Um, <laughs> when, you're in your, when you're trying to organize these events, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. And then overall, an overall sense of accomplishment and inspiration is what we are left with at, at the end of that. As volunteers, we formed bonds with athletes, with coaches, and as importantly, with fellow volunteers. To this day, there is a special bond with our volunteer group. And after a bit of reflection, so we had a bit of time to think and you know, regroup, now we're all thinking about what could be done differently? How can we make it? How can we make these things better? And when will we get another opportunity? And we're really looking forward to the opportunity to host the Olympics and Paralympics. The 2026 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games will really be a great show of Canmore volunteer power. It will help to create a new set of volunteers, and it will set a stage for future events to follow. To be honest, some of our volunteers are. are been around since 1988, and we could really use an infusion of new volunteers. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> Finally, a community that, that comes together to deliver an event such as the Olympics and Paralympics will create a common, will create a sense of common accomplishment, community pride, and energy. An active and involved community has the energy and has the con connectivity to address and solve any problems or challenges that may come its way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody now that'd like to speak in opposition? Is there anybody else who'd like to speak in support? <laughs> Hello, my name is Sylvia Stettler. Um, I don't have any numbers or quotes, so I'm going to speak in a purely emotional and nostalgic way. <clears throat> I moved to Canmore in 1980, and that time people would say to us, you're moving to Canmore? And in the back of their head, they were thinking, oh, poor you, you didn't quite make it to Banff. <laughs> <laughs> well. And I used to say, <laughs> it's true. I, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I used to say, I love it here. Look at the mountains. Look at the openness of this place. About a year later, I was sitting in a room like this where people were asking, what do the Olympics bring to us? And after a while, 
that question was turned around and people are asking, what can we do for the Olympics? And when the Olympics were actually here in 88, it was amazing, like everybody got involved. The local postmaster and employees, the local grocery store owner and employees, teachers, lawyers, doctors, um, homemakers, everybody was involved. Um, my children were old enough then to be at the opening ceremony at the Canmore Nordic Center. As little jackrabbits, they were able to um, carry flags for different countries. My mom was here from Switzerland. She was downtown Canmore when the torch was passed. She was able to hold the torch and pass it on. So with other words, it was just really <clears throat> an amazing experience. And my message is, let's keep an open mind and open hearts to the Olympic spirit and hopefully be able to welcome the world again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else then like to speak in support or opposed? Either way, no. Thank you very much, Mayor. My name is Bernie Asbell. I'm a resident of Canmore, and I'm also Vice President of Sport Operations for Windsport, the operator of Canada Olympic Park, Bill Warren Training Center, Hague Glacier, and Spray Lakes Village, which is a host site for many athletes in Canmore. I am speaking in support and in strongly encourage Council to uh, consider a supportive relationship uh, with the bid that will be approved ideally tomorrow in terms of a plebiscite in Calgary. We're a very large organization who's been strongly committed to sport in terms of discovery, development, and, and excellence for many years. We were the host site in 1988 for many of the Olympic activities, and of course we are going to be the host site for seven sports in Calgary in 2026. More importantly though, we are an employer in Canmore. We have a number of full-time employees, a number of part-time employees, and we service through accommodations in excess of 20 beds for athletes in subsidized housing. We would hope in the future through the subsidized housing program associated with 2026 to maintain those uh, beds and increase the number. You must understand that we have a 30-year legacy now from the Olympics. We have received endowment funds, but those endowment funds are decreasing on an annualized basis as our facilities age. We will be unable to maintain all the assets associated, including the facilities here, including our investments up in The Hague, contributions to the Frozen Thunder, which is a magnificent event concept in terms of starting skiing early every year, and of course the Bill Warren Training Center. We are also the host site of the uh, two national sport organizations based in Canmore and a provincial sport organization. We need our facilities updated and maintained so we can maintain employment in this community and our strong, strong commitment to sport in terms of development and excellence. And I'm going to restrict my language only to those elements. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Anybody else would like to speak? Good evening, Your Worship, Councillors and Administration. My name is Casey Pierce. Thank you, first of all, for all of your work on this so far. And I believe, as Ron said, um, you've really done a wonderful job of getting out in front of this, and we do appreciate it on behalf of the community. I believe it is prudent for Canmore to host the Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games in partnership with Calgary in 2026. It's a challenge to choose on just one issue to speak about tonight, and I know many have chosen to speak on more than one, but as a regular Rome bus user, I take the Rome Route 3 every day to Banff and back from Canmore to my office. I'm going to choose to speak on transit and parking today. Uh, I think we've all cringed when we've seen people run across that Trans-Canada Highway trying to get from Palliser Lands to downtown. 
Creating safe and efficient ways for residents to connect with downtown must and is a pri must be and is a priority. Town administration has said a pedestrian overpass is urgently required, and I agree. Hosting the 2026 games will help achieve this through bid-based dedicated infrastructure funding to support a project that we already know we need to build. This external funding will only come to us if we support a bid for the games. Otherwise, the costs will all be on the taxpayer. Why would we say no to funding that we need that will keep our costs down for a project that we have to build? The future of parking and transit in Canmore must be based on a vision that balances more pedestrian-friendly access with ways to get people out of their vehicles. The recent partnerships between towns and cities and the transit organizations in the Bow Valley have already resulted in excellent mass transit options that deliver the majority of key destinations in town and in the mountains. I personally feel like this should be celebrated and we should all be very proud of what has been achieved so far. It's an excellent first step in encouraging more environmentally responsible and sustainable ways to travel, and we still have a long ways to go. The games, I believe, can help us get there. There are many opportunities, revenue tools, and partner funding that come along with an Olympic and Paralympic bid. For example, Everyone can agree that in Vancouver, the Canada Line train from the Vancouver Airport downtown is an excellent addition to that city and is lauded as a success that came out of the Games in 2010. But did you know <laughs> that was not even part of their official, official bid plan? The Canada Line was a partner-funded initiative on the, side that came, on the side that came about because Vancouver leveraged the Games for private funding that the taxpayers would have eventually been on the hook for to get that project done. I think we all know that transit is a critical piece to solving congestion issues that all popular destinations face. This is just an example of one of the type of projects that might be possible if we move forward with open minds, facts, vision, and a plan to use those extra revenue tools that come along with voting yes to pursuing an Olympic and Paralympic Games bid. During the Games themselves, there will be great opportunities to enhance the way people move through our community. Intercept parking, shuttles, and mass transit from Calgary will allow patrons to experience our region in an environmentally responsible and sustainable way that limits congestion, carbon emissions, and leaves a lasting green legacy for our community for decades to come. The lasting legacy piece is critical, as the town of Canmore is currently planned to reach a build-out of a population of approximately 30,000 people. As has been stated already, the future is indeed coming and people are coming with it, whether or not we host a games. How often have we seen growing municipalities wait too long to plan and, plan and implement their transportation strategies? A few times. The 2026 games are a chance for Canmore to develop a strong transit plan to be prepared not only for the visitors that the games bring, but for the future community flow of the planned developments for those of us who live here now and our children and grandchildren who will continue to live here well past 2026. For this and many more reasons we are hearing tonight, it is extremely prudent for Canmore to support Calgary in their efforts to bid for the 2026 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any others who'd like to speak this evening? Right. Yep. Good evening, everyone, and good evening, Your Worship and Council, and thank you for, for letting us speak. Um, I'm a Heather Pierce, and I'm a resident of Canmore. I've worked at and volunteered at three Olympic Winter Games, um, and I'm wanting to talk to you. I believe it is prudent to co-host the 2026 Olympics, as we really do have the backing of a changing IOC. Why should we now have faith in the IOC? The world believes there has been such corruption in the past decades with the IOC executive. Consequently, the Olympic Agenda 2020 has been prepared and voted on by IOC members. It is a long document and takes many hours to digest, assuredly not high on your list of research regarding changes to future Olympics and the 2020, uh, 2026 Olympic Games which may be hosted by Calgary and Canmore. 
The IOC Olympic Agenda 2020 incorporates 40 recommendations which the IOC believe initiates transparency, sustainability, flexibility, and legacy towards the Olympic movement. Uh, after reviewing 40 proposed rules and bylaws written in the Olympic Agenda 2020 report, the Evaluation Committee then presented it to the IOC for approval. This is what the IOC now represents according to the 40 rules and bylaws ratified by the IOC. Let's begin. The IOC, due to the unprecedented high, cost, uh, con high construction costs of Olympic facilities, now state that they specifically prefer high host countries to have pre-built Olympic venues, therefore reducing capital costs and preventing overtures, overtures. Um, Calgary and Canmore, thanks to the 1988 Winter Olympics, has constructed and maintained 85% of its Olympic venues over the past 30 years. Our facilities in Canmore and Calgary have hosted numerous successful World, World Cups, national, provincial, regional, and municipal competitions and events at these facilities, training thousands of kids. The legacy of the 1988 Olympics has also provided much needed revenue and continued training facilities and events for young athletes. This is reflected in the increasing number of medals awarded to Canada over the past 30 years. Uh, the fact that there are so many truly lasting legacy re ve venues in Calgary and Canmore from 88 truly impressed the IOC. They have visited nine times at their own cost, just so you know. Something again new to the IOC. Their 2020 mandate expresses the need to honour clean athletes. The IOC want to strengthen their support for these wholesome athletes. The IOC will now contribute $10 million to con to communicate the risks of match fixing and any kind of manipulation and or related corruption. Another, a further 10 million will be added to support projects offering a new scientific approach to anti-doping. Now the new IOC mandate is to protect clean athletes and, and the integrity of sport by leading the fight against doping and by, and by taking action against all forms of manipulation of competition and related corruption. Another rule also much needed and approved in this document. Now the new IOC mandate is to protect uh, clean athletes and the integrity of sport by, did I read that? <laughs> by leading the fight against doping, by taking action against all forms, I did. Another rule, a formal ceremony will now be organized and held at the Olympic Games for medal winners to receive gold, silver, or bronze medals following the disqualification of competitors. There will also be proper communication during the ceremony of all those parties concerned. Further, the IOC will also work with the International Federation to achieve 50% female participation in the Olympic Games in future. And they, will, they also hope to stimulate women's participation and involvement in sport by creating more participation opportunities at the Olympic Games. In the 88 Winter Olympics, of the 1,423 athletes, there were 1,122 men and 301 females. Imagine what, with the insight of the IOC's 2020 agenda, we could have as many as 1,466 female athletes, in, and in the Paralympics, 375 female athletes. Ah! <laughs> no! <laughs> um, uh, briefly, I'll just talk about financial trust, transparency. They have to... Um, Actually, they, if, if you want to, have you provided that in written? Submission? I have it written, and so I can provide it to yeah, you later. Yes. For sure. All right. Either Too email bad. it or leave the written copy with yeah, uh, Ms. I'll get it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any others who would like to speak this evening? Council member, my name is Pierre Doyon. I live up in the Peace of Grassy. And uh, it's about two things tonight. It's about risk and opportunity, isn't it? It's all about risk and opportunity. That's what it boils down to. 
On the risk side, we've heard a lot about risk tolerance or intolerance or, or not willing to take some risk, and I get that. What I want to focus on is risk mitigation, risk management. What you, the collective you, collective us, should give us credit for is look at the space where we live in, in terms of balancing the mm, different issues that we're faced with. You have mechanisms in place. You have tools in place. You have an MDP, for instance. When I think about post-Olympics, uh, um, I'll think about, the, again, the tools you have in place. MDP is an incredible document where you've got a roadmap, you've got it all figured out, and you've got systems, processes that will help this community figure out how to benefit and how to extract the benefit from that investment. On the opportunity side, without repeating what's been said, two things have been mentioned. Of course, the um, affordable housing is, is for one. <clears throat> Excuse me, the second one being uh, public uh, transit. Also want to focus on one that we don't think about a lot, and it's called the nurturing of our vision. It's called the nurturing of our culture here in the Valley, more specifically in Camor here. Why are, people, why, why are people living here? Why people want to come here? They love this thing, they love this place, they love these values. So there's a point in time you want to be able to maintain your building and your infrastructure, but also you want to be nurturing your own culture as well. And I think that's one of the key legacy of this thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ma'am? Uh, my name's Sheila Mitchell Lennis, and I do think it's prudent for Canmore to host the two events of biathlon and cross country skiing for the Olympics in 26. Um, what I'd like to talk about is how the Olympics can inspire a whole generation of kids in sport in our community and beyond. And I think it's a theme that's been talked about already. Uh, many of us in Canmore have had the pleasure of raising kids in this community where cross-country skiing and biathlon at the Nordic Center is a way of life, and it, it still is. So today, on a typical race day, the Nordic Center is swarming with uh, young skiers from all over the province, and um, they're inspired by Olympic dream, they're surrounded by real-life Olympians, and these young racers are part of a team. And they balance their schoolwork and their active lifestyles, and then they go on to find their way in the world. And I can't think of a better way to reinvigorate this inspiration for future generations of young people than hosting the games. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any others who'd like to speak this evening? Sir? My name is Ivan Dixon. I'm a local resident. Two items I'd like to talk about. The first is why. I'm uh, obviously, you can tell by now, I'm a no. I hear that this will put us on the map. Hmm, that's what the last one was supposed to do. And as far as Canmore is concerned, I don't think we need any more profile. We have too many non-residents already buying homes. I walk down the street and I see so many homes and I'm thinking, I haven't seen a vehicle of that one in six months. I think it's been a year since I last saw a vehicle there. We're also going to see higher demand because of this on our housing. Prices, pressure's going to result. I think with the Olympics, we're going to see an increase in the lower salary jobs, not the higher or the middle. I'm concerned that the incremental 218 units we're getting in housing is actually going to be too small because the incremental amount will be greater than 218. Our downtown footprint is too small for today, too not enough footprint place for businesses, traffic, and parking. Our town itself, we're in too big of a community and too small of an area. We don't need extra demand. I'll now move to money. Our bridge is going to cost $5 million. Let's assume we get $2 million. That's $3 million for us here in Canmore. Stats Canada says we have 4,700 residences in here. Let's add some businesses, some more homes over the next few years. Let's say $6,000. $3 million divided by $6,000 is $500 for each individual taxpayer. I would prefer that we spent less than that 
And I think we can get a better deal when we're not on a rough schedule and when there's lower demand for money. We're going to have to expand our bus system. Let's say six buses. I've read 60 days. Let's say 10 hours a day. Bus drivers currently get $100 a day, I understand, in Calgary for eight-hour days. I start throwing in some benefits. I've got half a million just for this labor. Divide by 6,000, that's $83 for each of us. Are we going new buses? I understand a new bus is $400,000 each, times six is two and a half million. Detroit went with the 45 footers and wanted to be more environmentally friendly. They bought natural gas buses. Those buses cost them $700,000 US per bus. That's a lot of money. I think this pushes us then down the road that we're going to have to use secondhand buses. Go to other communities and buy their old buses when they sell them. We're going to need at least 10. We're going to have breakdowns. And in old buses, say, most places keep them for 20 years, you're going to have to have at least uh, two on a standby. I'm getting another half a million dollars. The casino to Canmore bus route, can we pay for that? I don't think so. Who expands the parking lot? For 60 days and then the imp impact it has, drippings, etc. We've got to pave a trail from Quarry Lake parking lot to the Nordic Center. We're going to have extra garbage, more snow, more bylaw enforcement, more parking management. We've got lots of other things we're going to have to do. The province says 700 million. We have 3 million income tax payers in Alberta, $233 each. The feds say 1.5 billion. There are 28 million taxpayers in Canada. That's $54 each. I'm not going to include any numbers on housing, but I've already at $1,240. Now, yes, we're going to see a benefit on housing, etc. But 1,240 is too much. I say no to Olympics. Let's do our plans on our own schedule, on our own pl uh, plan, on our own approach. Thank you. Does anybody else would like to speak this evening? Sorry. Um, you said I have 50 minutes. Is that what I heard? Five zero. <laughs> Is that okay? I don't think there'd be anybody left in the okay, room. Okay, perfect. Um, success. Um, thank you again for uh, the opportunity to speak. My name is Ken Davies. Uh, I've been a resident in Canmore for 25 years and uh, have been involved somewhat in, in helping uh, run events as a volunteer, both at the Nordic Center and in the swimming pool and the soccer pitches and on the bike trails and hiking trails. So uh, very much for an active community, and that's what drives my interest in, in supporting sport. Um, but uh, what I want to point out is, is, or what I want to address is the question, is it prudent? So is it prudent for us to consider uh, joining the bid with Calgary? First of all, the council, you've been prudent, um, and I give you credit. Uh, number one, assigning Lisa DeSoto and Jim Yunker full-time to the organization, the Bidco organization, that is incredibly prudent. So you're so aware of what's actually going on. I wish the city of Calgary had been so prudent. I wish the federal government had been so prudent. I wish the provincial government had been so prudent. So instead of politicking, you're actually trying to understand and find it out and give you full credit for that. Um, with regard to, uh, I think one of the speakers just recently said, you know, what is the balance of risk and reward, or what is the balance of opportunity and reward? And that's this question of prudence, and you have to vote on that next week. So do you believe it's worth the opportunity? And I'm gonna put out a few things, a few ideas of why I think it is prudent for council to consider joining the bid. Um, you can view the Olympic as an opportunity or a catalyst. So is it prudent to ignore a catalyst? Uh, I don't think it is, so you can view it as a catalyst in finances, and when we hear people come up here and talk about numbers, I always get scared because I don't think any of us know what the right number will be. I don't think any of us know how much something's going to cost or whether there'll be cost recovery against it exactly and how that's going to play. What I do know is it will cost us money, and you have to believe you're on a fork as 
Norbert Meyer pre presented and saying we're either going to uh, do it with the Olympics or without the Olympics. So my view on it is if we have some money coming in, that's great. But even more important than that for me is the catalyst. So we have the catalyst to say, let's address this. So I hear a bunch of issues that are brought up about, um, you know, we need a bridge. You already have that in your capital plan. We need to preserve our wildlife corridors. We need to make sure there's uh, perpetually affordable housing or low income housing. That is your, sorry you guys, that's your job. You run the place, we don't. So that's your job to do with the Olympics as a catalyst. So is it prudent to use the Olympics as a catalyst so that you can address more of those issues, not just from a financial perspective, but from a focus perspective. Think how much focus this has brought to perpetual, afford perpetual affordable housing in the last two months because we've been paying attention to it. So continue to pay attention to it. And the Olympics is a perfect venue to do that. Transportation, preservation of wildlife corridors. Uh, the Olympic plan includes an overpass on the highway for wildlife. I mean, those are things that are saying, whoa, well, we might not get those or we might have to pay for them in another way. So I think it's, you have to be careful when you're answering the question, is it prudent? Because you're missing the opportunity or you're missing the catalyst. There's two things I want to talk about up at the Nordic Center. So one is accessibility. A few people have talked about the Paralympians. Uh, if you have not uh, been to a Paralympic event anywhere, including the Nordic Center, you're missing out. You've never seen life lived or spirit lived until you've seen the Paralympic athletes in action. So I encourage you to come up the next time we have a Paralympic event at the Nordic Center and participate as a volunteer, participate just as a spectator because it will inspire you for the rest of your life. By having the Olympics we can make the Nordic Center and Canmore more accessible. The Nordic Center is not that accessible for Paralympic athletes surprisingly. Uh, it was never built for it and all the door frames, everything, nothing works for a Paralympian. So this is a small cost and we're going to have to absorb it in the, in the bid process but it makes Canmore known as the place that endorses accessibility. The other thing I want to talk about is the Nordic Center itself. All that's contemplated for the Olympics is the same footprint. We're not looking at a bigger footprint, a better footprint, it's the same footprint. Okay, so we have the same trails, the same buildings, that's what's contemplated. There's some upgrades, there's some extra snow making, things like that, but there's no extra footprint. So we're doing this as an environmentally sensitive manner as possible. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you. Are there any others who'd like to speak? Go ahead. Hi, I'm Alistair Derechuk. And uh, I'm a little bit, I'm going to say that no to the, to the question. Um, I am fairly close to the fence, though. Um, honestly, if I go up to the Nordic Center and stand under the Canadian flag, uh, there is definitely emotion attached to, you know, it lives in this town many years after the 88 Olympics. There are a lot of good things that are still here and I'm sure there would be the same thing um, going on if everything, all of the decks were, or all of, all of the things were to fall into place and we were to have it repeat in 2026. There would definitely be some positive things and it's going to work out well no matter what happens um, and I'll be cheering for our Canadian athletes. However, when I have to look at it from a selfish perspective and I look at the overall, do I think it's prudent for this community? My answer, and my answer is no. Um, we've had a couple of people bring up the concept of carrying capacity, build out 30,000. Um, some would feel that we are already past capacity. Some would say we're right there. For me, my own personal comfort level, yeah, I'd like to take a step back. That doesn't mean I'm right. We're probably all right. Um, but that's what it comes down to. My own personal view, no, it's not prudent. We're becoming a little bit, some of the, the what we are, there's environment, there's people, the, uh, there is the attitude that comes with Olympics that is a very positive thing. Um, our society is also changing a little bit to the point where it's feeling a little bit like we're approaching being a city. My own comfort level doesn't fit with that. So that's where my answer is it prudent ends up being a no. Again, doesn't make me right, but we'll all get along anyway. Um, regarding some of the things, uh, uh, perpetually affording ho affordable housing was brought up a couple of times. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a bit of a cold, so. <clears throat> uh, a couple of years ago, maybe, um, not sure exactly when, but I, in, uh, in the Outlook, there was a statement from a, a spokesperson from Banff and Lake Louise Tourism about 
concern with what an increase in the minimum wage would do to businesses in Banff. Probably, I'm going to say it was a week, two weeks later tops, there was um, another statement that was basically suggesting that Banff, the town of Banff needed to take some responsibility for housing those employees. So when we talk about perpetually affordable housing, when we talk about affordable, we're really talking about something that we probably don't have control over in this community, and that is wage gap. Um, where the Olympics, if they were to occur here, would take us with that, I'm not so sure that a pocket of perpetual affordable housing units with a fairly small pocket of people chosen to benefit from them really addresses the idea of affordable. It's a start, and it's something that has to be looked at, but when I look at PAH as being a major gain from an Olympic bid process, I'm a little bit less convinced that that's actually tackling the problem, and I'm not sure that we ca actually can tackle that problem. That seems to be a little bit more global to me. And there are steps that need to be taken, but I'm not sure that the trade there for what the community, the, the amount of change that can happen in the community, whether that trade is, is one that I could support. Um, there was one other thing, and I can't remember what it was now. Oh, whether change is going to happen, whether we, uh, whether we choose to have it happen or not, we're already well known. There is going to be growth. There's going to be pressure for growth. Absolutely. Um, I know decisions that I make in my household would be much different if I'm planning on having the family over for Christmas Eve, and it's next week. I'm going to end up buying things on a rushed schedule that I might make slightly different choices if I was making those decisions just over a course of time. And I think that was a bad example, but um, I ended up, last time they were out, I bought a stove. Um, with a, for a community, we are very, very adept at weighing all of the issues and being cautious, looking at the pros and cons. This process is part of that. External pressure with a deadline that the world is watching, I think can be a bit of a dangerous thing, which is also what pushed me over the fence to, the, to say no from my point of view. Thank you. Thank you. And just to set the record straight, particularly since there's a Banff councillor here, uh, I, I do want to note the town of Banff is also taking responsibility for uh, housing needs in their community. Having just opened Tino, which is 130 units of, pardon me? 123 units of housing and so both communities are, are working to address the housing needs as best we can. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's fantastic. I, the other point to that was that I think some of that pressure is uh, not completely solved by that. It's external things that are beyond what we can do. Sure. Uh, I'm gonna just, by show of hands, there are, are there many others that wanna speak? Because normally we will take a break after two hours, but if there's only one or two other speakers, then I think we can soldier on through. Uh, this woman wanted to speak again, which normally we don't allow, but uh, is there anybody else that would like to speak this evening? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, then... Okay, so council wants to stick with our normal normal protocol, and but you're welcome to uh, email council or whatever. So, if there are no other people that haven't spoken that would like to speak, I'll call. Okay, I should have been quicker. Okay. Your Worship and Council Members, um, my name is Beth Vandevoort and I'm the Executive Director for the Downtown Canmore Business Association. Um, thank you for this evening and thank you for the process over the last few months because to be honest with you I was very proud that um, Town of Canmore um, 
got busy and started involving everybody in the community right away when the discussions started to get serious with Calgary because I have a daughter living in Calgary and it wasn't happening there and she was quite envious. <laughs> so thank you for this evening also and for the question that was posed. Um, on a quarterly basis, um, we at the Downtown Business Association um, do a, a survey to our 200 plus business members and this time I pose the question that is before us tonight and of the folks that um, responded, 80% 80 percent responded with a yes. So this is from small businesses um, in, our, in your downtown. Some of them are retail, some of them were professional businesses. Um, it was interesting because it was a really great cross-section of the folks that um, own, uh, some of them own property in the downtown also. So as we move forward um, as a downtown business community in, 19, uh, in 2019, one of the things that we're going to be looking at doing and working with the town on is an update of the 1998 Downtown Enhancement Plan. And so when we were looking at what that process might look like, um, we also took into consideration the potential of the 2026 Olympics and what that would allow us to dream to do. And we feel that one of the things is that the capital improvements that perhaps otherwise would not be considered um, in the time frame leading up to 2026 would be addressed because we know that there has to be long-term budget set in place in order to accomplish many of the things that we'd like to see done in the downtown. We also, my businesses are very concerned about increasing their um, visitation to their businesses um, by locals and by tourists outside of the summer season. And so for, ex but having said that, this summer we had some interesting dynamics so three things affected our downtown businesses this summer. Um, the first one was the smoke in August. Um, there was definitely an impact on how their businesses did. Um, the second thing was the snow in September. Mm -hmm. And the third thing was the cost of wages that increase um, in going up towards um, the $15 an hour. Because many of our businesses in downtown pay in excess of that already. Um, we were very excited to be able to also to dream about in preparation of and going forward and as a legacy of the Olympics um, housing for supervisory management staff and housing for seasonal staff. We know that on the, uh, that, uh, the town of Camar in its long-term range, long range plans have considered and are still considering building additional housing even if the Olympics don't go forward. But we also know that that will hopefully precipitate some advance of some of, this, uh, of, some of that um, capital spending. And of course, as been mentioned a number of times tonight, at the pedestrian walkway over the highway. And um, because as many of the people would love to be able to ride their bikes or they would prefer not to bring their cars downtown, but for safety reasons or because it's winter, et cetera, and they, although they live over in that area, they find themselves in, uh, you know, not not most uh, advantageous uh, uh, travel uh, ways to get here. How is that? So though we can dream, um, we also understand as business people that we have to be responsible and we have to look at budgets and we have to make sure that whatever is decided that, um, that we are being financially savvy in how, how we take those responsibilities and we know that the town of Camor will also look at that because none of us really want to see our, our tax, property tax bills go up substantially. So that's kind of our viewpoint at this point in time and I want to thank you for letting us be part of this particular process. Thank you. And I think that's all that we only get to speak once, I'm sorry. But you can email council with other perspective if you like. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And um, with that, I'll uh, adjourn the public hearing. Thanks for being here. <laughs>